I'm here to introduce our second panel of the morning. We're kind of doing yin and yang from hybrid warfare. We now want to talk about ballistic missile defense. How do we get the right balance between what our traditional missions are and what the growing requirements might be? It doesn't say growing in your little leaflet. It says a multi-syllable word that I have trouble pronouncing, so stick with growing. The panel's moderated by Captain Robbie Harris, U.S. Navy retired. Robbie and I go back to farther than we want to think about working strategic planning in the Navy and the Marine Corps, um, starting in the early 80s and moving on through to the 90s. And Robbie outlived me and actually had a great impact on the current maritime strategy after I had left. He's a sailor, scholar, warrior. Uh, he's done many things in the surface Navy, including all types of command. He has had a direct impact because of his writing and speaking skills on much of the strategic thinking that's gone on and still goes on today. So he's the right guy to be leading a panel thinking about this particular topic as our last panel of the morning. We look forward to having you all interact with him. Captain Harris, the floor is yours, sir. Sir, sure, thank you very much. General, thank you very much for those uh, very kind words. I appreciate it very much. Well, um, let's get on with it. Uh, w w let's make this a, a different sort of a panel and a different sort of interaction. I'm going to begin with a couple of propositions. And I will offer these propositions not only to the panel, but also to you. So at, after the panel members speak, uh, we will expect you not only to ask questions, but to respond to the, the propositions that I'm about to offer. Uh, the first proposition is that the month of April was an especially propitious one for the Navy and for Navy ballistic missile defense. Why do I say that? On 15 April, there was a flight test mission number 15, which was extraordinarily successful. And I think several of the panel members will probably refer to that uh, later this morning, FTM 15. And then on the 29th of <clears throat> April, the Department of the Navy submitted a report to Congress which said the requirement exists for 94, 94 major surface combatants. And that number draws heavily on the requirement for ballistic missile defense. Proposition one, April was a good month for Navy. Uh, April was a good month for Navy ballistic missile defense. Proposition number two draws on the word transformational. You remember the word transformational, which was tripping off everybody's tongue about a, a decade or so ago. Here is the, the proposi second proposition. Navy BMD is truly a, prop a transformational capability for the U.S. Navy just as transformational as was nuclear propulsion, just as transformational as was submarine-launched ballistic missiles, just as transformational as was Aegis uh, combat mission control. BMD, the proposition is, falls in the same panoply of those transformational capabilities. <clears throat> proposition number three, and that is that Ballistic missile defense is especially transformational for the surface Navy. Why is that? During the Cold War, I would argue that the surface Navy existed to protect or to augment something else. The surface Navy provided AAW, ASW, ASUW to protect the carrier and to protect the arms. I would argue that surface combatants had no independent mission of their own. Tomahawk changed that to some degree. For the first time, surface combatants had a strike role. And for the first time, the president started asking, where is the closest Tomahawk shooter? BMD, I think, falls in the same category. This is a capability that the surface Navy can do and no one else can do. It provides the surface Navy with a, an inherently strategic capability. So those are several propositions that I would ask the panel to respond to. 
and ask you to respond to as the morning wears on. So now let me introduce the panel. Uh, I have offered only two bits of guidance to them to the extent that I can offer guidance to this esteemed group. But it is, it is number one, to hold your comments to three to five minutes. And secondly, don't say something to us that we can read in Navy Times last week. Let's hear something new, and I, I believe they will do that. Our first panel member is Vice Admiral uh, Peter Daly. He is a graduate of the College of Holy Cross with a degree in economics and did his master's degree at the Postgraduate School in Operations Research Ops, Ops Analysis. <clears throat> he knows his way around the waterfront. Uh, he served on the USS Rourke, Stump, the PHM, the Hercules, Yorktown. He commanded the destroyer Russell and uh, also was the Commodore of Destroyer Squadron 31. He is no stranger to the E-Ring. He was the Deputy EA to the Vice Chief. He was the EA to the J-8 down on the Joint Staff, and he was the Senior Military Advisor to the Secretary of the Navy. Along the way, he learned the specific especially well. He was the EA to uh, Commander-in-Chief, I guess it was called Commander-in-Chief then, PAC Fleet, and Sink PAC. Uh, he, as I said, also has experience on the, um, uh, on the Joint Staff. Uh, at sea, he also commanded Carrier Strike Group 11, which supported OEF and OIF. Uh, most recently, he was the assistant to the N3, N5. In that capacity, he was on board for the uh, creation, along with Brian uh, and others, and the uh, new maritime strategy, the cooperative strategy for 21st century sea power. And of course, now he is the deputy at CFSC. We look forward to hearing the Admiral's comments. Ramel Horn is seated next to him. His career parallels to a certain extent that of uh, Admiral Daly. Only Admiral Horn is a graduate of the Naval Academy with a degree, a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, but he also took a master's degree out at Monterey in operations research, uh, ops analysis, uh, service aboard a number of surface combatants to include the USS Samson, uh, the Robert G. Bradley, the Tycho, the Anzio, and the Stout. He commanded the Stout, and he also commanded Lake Erie. And when he was in command of Lake Erie, when Lake Erie had a number of especially important BMD uh, trials that were most successful. Um, he is also serving the Joint Staff down in J-8 at the Joint Forces Command and in OPNAV on N-86. We look forward to hearing from Admiral Horn. Uh, Brian McGrath, seated next to Emma Horn, submitted an especially concise uh, bio, um, but I must tell you he is a remarkable fellow, uh, retired as a captain select after commanding a, a most successful uh, early boat <coughs> command here in Norfolk, came to Washington after that command, uh, worked in the N3 and 5 organization in which he was the lead for putting together and then drafting, writing the cooperative strategy for 21st century uh, sea power. Now some would say he was just, just moving fingers on a keyboard. Not true. Admiral Morgan, Vice Admiral Morgan, who was N3 and 5 at the time, and Admiral Daly, who was the deputy to Admiral Morgan, they gave Brian extraordinary authority and responsibility to go out and decide how that new strategy should look, what it should contain, what areas it should emphasize. There's probably no one who, is, who better understands the where and why fors of the cooperative strategy for 21st century uh, sea power than Brian McGrath. Uh, Brian, after retiring from the Navy, uh, went to work for Delex Corporation, and he is the founding director of the Delex Consulting Studies and Analysis Branch. Uh, Brian took his BA degree from the University of Virginia and a master's degree from the Catholic University of the United States. Uh, we look forward to hearing from Brian, and with that, I'll turn it over to Admiral Daly. Well, thank you. Uh, it's good to be here this morning. Uh, I'm Pete Daly. I'm from Fleet Forces. I'm here to help. Uh, we're going to talk about an inherently joint area today, but you're going to hear a, a very Navy-centric uh, view of how we contribute into that joint architecture. But uh, there is a lot going on. 
um, in the Navy area of the contribution to the ballistic missile defense system. As a matter of context, uh, Fleet Forces is responsible to push out and force generate our forces from the East Coast. And we also have other responsibilities for the whole Navy with respect to the standards and the certifications. We also are the CNO's agent for global force management, so we have a view on the demand for naval forces. And I just wanted to give you a couple of numbers this morning. Uh, you know, back in the day when we had a good, reliable enemy in, uh, in the Soviet Union, um, we could count on certain things. And we had a rhythm for the deployment of the Navy, who's been on a rotational expeditionary watch bill continuously since 1949. But we've been in this. Uh, We've been in this watch bill and this rhythm, but that rhythm could be depended on on any given day you'd wake up and about 36 to 38 percent of the Navy was underway. Maybe on a big day you'd go north of that, and about 25 to 28 percent of the Navy was deployed. Well, things have changed. Uh, this morning when we got up and we pushed the, the Bush 545 this morning, George Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, deployed for her maiden deployment from right here at the piers in Norfolk, and we're at 60 percent underway. And the deployed number is 44 percent. So the tempo of our maritime forces is very high. And sometimes I think that gets overlooked in the context of what is a land-centric conflict, obviously, in uh, Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. So against that backdrop, we're introducing BMD capability. And today we sit at about 21 ships that are modified for this capability, and we're building out uh, that capability over the next few years to get up to 37, 38 ships uh, by FY15 here. So we're bringing on this new capability, but we're delivering this capability into a group of ships that's already heavily, um, heavily in demand and heavily in use. And the difference, too, for the Navy, and you know, you could have won money off me if you said back in 1983 that Aegis, which was introduced as a fleet air defense system, would develop into what it's developed into today. But hugely successful and impactful in that role. And those, those capabilities are now growing into this BMD-capable uh, uh, system. But if you look at it, it's still being fielded on a multi-mission ship, and I think that's hugely important, because in different parts of our uh, strategic and semi-strategic uh, capability areas, there's a tendency to buttonhole this particular mission area into a single purpose area. So if they say, why are those Navy guys still trying to keep tactical control of these ships? Why does the Navy want to work this through their components? It's because of that. These ships do everything. And we just had a, a terrific example of that with Stout. You know, Stout's one of those 21 ships, and it was recently um, in the Mediterranean when the, uh, the Libya thing popped up. And here's Stout. They were there as a BMD ship, but also as other things. And they got called upon to do their tomahawk strikes, and uh, we were sending tomahawks out there. They were doing reloads in Sigonella and uh, fire in their tomahawks within a couple hours after reloading. And they did this more than once. And uh, a huge example of how you can swing naval forces um, across AOR lines, the example of the Kearsarge, which was swung from CENTCOM. The Marines were pulled out of combat in southern Afghanistan and joined those ships in the Med. The Stout, Aki, no, Aya, you're over here, and you're in another fight. So I can't emphasize that too much, that the Navy views this as one capability in a multi-mission platform, but what a platform it is. And we were very proud, for instance, in uh, early 08, when um, at the time President Bush said, hey, we need to take out this uh, satellite that was uh, a dead satellite that had a dangerous hydrazine fuel uh, compound on board and was going to present a hazard to people on the ground. We need to take this out. And as you know, we do not have a national anti-satellite capability, but we, we made, at the time, a one-time modification to the Aegis system, to the missile and the software, to be able to take out this uh, thing that was moving through space at six miles per second, and to shoot uh, on 
a target that we didn't have in track, it had never been done, and uh, modified the missile, modified the systems, put it on a fleet multi-mission ship, sent it to sea with other ships as backups who were trained to be the backups, and with a fleet system, with fleet sailors at the console, uh, executed this mission, and it was very impressive. I think that made, I think that set the table for what uh, became in September of 2009 the President's decision to do the phased adaptive approach for uh, BMD defense in Europe. At the time, we were on a path to do uh, GBIs in Europe, uh, but it was going to be a, a missile, a new variant, a two-stage variant of the missile. And I think that the decision makers looked at the, the problem set, looked at the regional threat that was really already right there, and looked at Aegis and said, Aegis can do this. Um, Aegis has the shorter range capabilities that are needed, and we're going to throw Aegis at this. So now, today, and over the past year, we at Fleet Forces have been working on putting Aegis ashore in locations like uh, Romania and Poland. So if you thought, you know, you could have won money off me in a bar 10 years ago if you said, hey, are we going to have uh, a, a cruise jacket patch with uh, Devasulu, uh, Romania on it, but, but we are. So uh, that's where we're at today, fielding these systems, um, incredibly capable uh, missile system that it is, the SM-3 family, to do intermediate, medium, and short-range missile defense both with the uh, SM-3s and with the uh, SM-2 Block 2As. And uh, I'll leave it at that. It's been an exciting time. But leave with this, multi-mission, here today, going to Romania. Thank you. Good, uh, good morning. Um, my name is Rear Admiral Joe Horn. I'm the Program Executive at Aegis Ballistic Missile Defense in Dahlgren, Virginia. It's a little bit about uh, our location. We, we have uh, about 253 uh, uh, engineers, government, civilians, and military. Uh, about uh, 70 are, uh, are Navy billets uh, provided to us by Naval Sea Systems Command. About uh, 153 are, uh, are from the Missile Defense Agency. And uh, our ob objective down there, our task, is to, uh, to develop and resource about uh, five ballistic missile defense programs that will find their way, as the Admiral has rightly said, on board uh, multi-mission ships or, or in capability that will be manned by sailors uh, of the fleet. Uh, just a couple of points on uh, what we've been asked to address today. First, this question about the balancing of traditional missions and, uh, and new or burgeoning requirements, I, I don't feel is a new question. Certainly on every ship that I've ever served on, they've all been classified as multi-mission ships. And so logic would tell us that at one point or another, each mission area has had to go through this new uh, balancing act, or if you will, or, or consideration amongst and against other missions that, uh, that have already existed. And so uh, I don't believe this is something that, uh, that we are wrestling with for the first time. The second is that this isn't a condition that has been forced on the United States Navy. In fact, the Navy has uh, advocated, pursued, uh, looked after this mission since uh, the early 90s, and, uh, and uh, in fact, probably even before that. But the, uh, the, the strong advocacy that occurred in the mid-90s that has uh, developed into a resource uh, developed program uh, building off of a Navy foundation really started about then. So the, the problem that we find ourselves in, or the current situation, a lot of forward-looking heroes uh, in the United States Navy sort of created that, uh, that where we are today. Uh, the, uh, the, the final point I'll make before I'll make a, a recommendation is that we have achieved some success building off of that advocacy, and, and I would credit that success uh, not only to a, uh, to a lot of uh, very dedicated individuals, but uh, a, a build a little, test a little uh, mantra that was born out of the Aegis program that said we have a foundation and, and we, don't wanna, we don't want a wholesale development effort. We don't want to create a lot of new stuff, but rather we want to build off of what we know and, uh, and get to a, a capability in, in short of s small steps. That, uh, that build a little, test a little 
uh, mantra has been reinforced by the Navy's discipline system engineering approach. The, the Navy builds things like, uh, like no other organization that I have, uh, I have seen, and, and it, in fact, uh, that approach has served us uh, very, very well. Lastly, uh, uh, at least in the time uh, since the creation of the Missile Defense Agency, we have been adequately resourced by the agency to achieve those objectives that we have stepped out to do. Uh, my recommendation is that in guidelines for this kind of uh, situation that we find ourselves in, I think there are a couple of things that we should consider when we are looking at uh, bringing in or adopting these missions and how we, uh, how we, we, uh, we bring them into that multi-mission capability. And the first is to build off of a strong service foundation. As the Admiral said, uh, the Aegis weapon system has served as that capability core for us and, and enabled us to uh, leveraging off of that system engineering machinery to uh, provide to, uh, to the Navy what they already have and what they already know. So for example, uh, the uh, FTM-15 or the satellite shoot down was done by fleet sailors on the same equipment at the same consoles using the same uh, sensors, if you will, and the same missiles that they would use uh, if they were to do this in, uh, at war tomorrow. It, uh, we don't bring special uh, test assets on board. Everything is done from a, uh, in a shipboard environment. The second is that you need to identify the costs associated with that capability, and you need to make sure that you have a strong agreement uh, in this case, with the missile defense between the missile defense agency and the Navy, on how you're going to uh, identify and resource those costs. Certainly, the uh, uh, General O'Reilly, my boss, his effort to create overarching memorandums of agreement with each service, which talks about how we're going to identify, resource, and then transition those capabilities, uh, has been has led itself to uh, to that end. And then uh, uh, lastly, you want to make sure to the maximum extent possible that uh, the tactical employment and the training that occurs on those systems is common with, uh, with service experience so that you don't have to, again, create things out of, new, out of whole cloth. Those three steps are what I would recommend and how we uh, continue to capture uh, that new capability and then provide it to, uh, to those multi-mission ships that, uh, that we see in the fleet today. Thank you very much again for the opportunity to participate. Good morning. My name is Brian McGrath. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking AFSIA and the Naval Institute for bringing me back down to Hampton Roads, a place I called home for a big part of 21 years in the Navy. It's always a good day when I can drive here down the Delmarva Peninsula and not get a ticket in Exmoor, Virginia. Um, I'd like to thank Robbie for his stewardship of this panel. and. Uh, his friendship and mentoring over the years. Uh, and I'd like especially like to, to thank uh, Admirals Daly and Horn for six decades of service to their country, uh, many years of friendship to me, and especially your Job-like patience and forbearance with me uh, while we serve together. Um, I'd like to focus first on the title of our panel, Ballistic Missile Defense. How do we achieve the right balance between traditional missions and burgeoning requirements? Uh, I speak today in favor of imbalance, and I advocate, I advocate elimination of the worship of balance as an attribute when we talk about defense spending. Balance is a concept behind which the lazy hide instead of making true strategic choices. A balanced military is one that will continue to misallocate the precious treasure of the taxpayers in an effort to ensure military departments are equally favored in each year's budget. Giving us a military, in light of the uh, budget cuts that are coming, that ultimately does many of the same things we do today, except less well and in fewer places. Additionally, balance is a notion that has bedeviled people in the Navy ever since the maritime strategy came out in 2007, convincing some to believe that the now famous line, preventing war is as important as winning war, means that operations on the low end are as critical as those on the high end, and so should be resourced in a more balanced way. Nothing could be farther from the truth. The vast majority of the resources applied to preventing war 
are those that build and maintain the forces and capabilities necessary for winning war. That is, preventing war is deterrence. And ballistic missile defense, as a new breed of conventional deterrence, sits in the first order of those capabilities. Next, I'd like to talk about cost-imposing strategies, especially the one China is imposing on us today. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the concept. Andy Marshall at Net Assessment raised it to high, high art in competition with the Soviet Union. Uh, China is building ballistic missiles at a frightening rate, some of which are targetable against ships. These missiles are considerably less expensive than the interceptors and the systems we build to destroy them, imposing upon us an excessive cost. How will we ultimately disrupt this cost imposition strategy? Um, ultimately, part of the answer may lie in what some believe are exotic weapons, like uh, lasers and railgun. Um, we'll never get to that answer if we uh, gut the S&T and R&D budgets uh, necessary to bring those systems forward in a meaningful way that will enable us to uh, impact this cost imposition strategy. Uh, the final topic I'd like to roll out is uh, that of the Navy's new Air Missile Defense Radar System, or AMDR. Uh, AMDR, uh, for the, those of you who don't know, is uh, spy on steroids. Uh, it's, a, it's a radar adept in, equally adept in addressing um, air breathing threats as it is uh, ballistic missiles. Um, but AMDR is not going to address that threat, uh, the ballistic missile threat, on its own. It will do so as part of an ensemble of systems, land-based, sea-based, and space-based, uh, which together must interoperate in order to neutralize those threats. Uh, I don't know the program manager of AMDR, but I have a feeling that deep in his heart of hearts, uh, one of his greatest challenges, one of his greatest headaches, is the Missile Defense Agency. He views them as such because they own the missile defense architecture into which AMDR must fit, which means they have a tendency to drive requirements, and in some cases, requirements he feels drive up the cost of his program, something he surely doesn't want to happen, especially when his program is primarily paper right now. There's got to be a better way to run the railroad. Uh, we'll eventually pay for the integration of AMDR into the broader architecture, but it will be late in the game and it will be enormously expensive. Wouldn't it be nice to build in that interoperability and those requirements at the front end? Wouldn't it be nice if the Navy and the Missile Defense Agency could co-evolve and co-engineer AMDR in a way that gives the best chance of seamlessly merging that radar into the ensemble, and one ins that ensures that the radar isn't over in a manner that ignores the capability of other systems and increases design and acquisition costs? That's probably enough to get some conversation started. Once again, thanks to AFSIA and the Naval Institute for having me on this panel today. Well, <clears throat> well, they all followed the directions. No more than five minutes per person, and they're to be commended for that. And most of what they said, you, would not, you could not have read in Navy Times um, last week or the, or the week before. OK, who has the first question? Yes, sir. Gentlemen, uh, Lieutenant Jay Boyles, currently assigned to Riveron 3. Uh, this question is more uh, kind of operational level type of thing, but as the Navy BMD capability evolves and is deployed forward, uh, I think it would be safe to assume that our adversaries would see those BMD shooters as high value assets uh, in the same way that aircraft carriers and uh, large deck amphibs are viewed. Would you say that there's a corresponding shift in thinking on the part of Navy operational planners in terms of viewing these ships as high value assets and that steps are being taken uh, in terms of doctrine and operational planning to, to protect those, those assets. Thank you. Admiral Daly? Well, let me take that one on for the first cut. Well, the first discussion was should these be single purpose assets where we sent them out and they were just focused, could we save $1.50 by just focusing them on a single mission area? And because of the points you just made, Lieutenant, we decided that they needed to be multi-mission ships that could defend themselves well. And uh, as you know, if you build on these platforms, the CGs and the DDGs, they are in an excellent position, you know, whether it's surface, ASW, AAW, uh, to do just that. But you bring up a terrific point. When you put that uh, BMD-capable ship out on point alone, it really does have to be able to uh, take care of all the threats 
And um, I'm pleased and proud to say that because of the collaboration that we've had as we've developed this baseline approach to improve capability on a proven platform, that now we're to the point where the ships can do BMD and if somebody says, okay, good for BMD, but here, suck up a couple of uh, anti-ship cruise missiles, they are able to uh, deal with that threat as well. I think you will see in different environments uh, as you progress into higher phases of conflict, uh, efforts to uh, provide sanctuary for certain key assets. And yes, I do envision that sometimes that key asset would be the, the BMD ship. But I think the biggest decision we made and the best decision we made in that vein was to make sure that that ship had the full benefit of all its capabilities. Admiral Horn, Brian, any comments? Uh, to uh, uh, just to echo Admiral Daly's uh, uh, facts and figures, the, the, uh, on the test range, I, I have watched uh, ships track submarines while tracking ballistic missiles and while launching standard missiles. I have watched uh, them uh, go right from a standard missile launch into a, uh, into a Tomahawk countdown so uh, in, in ensuring that they're conducting that. They're conducting electronic warfare and those other missions. So, so on the range, at every opportunity, uh, our, uh, our Navy's sponsors uh, endeavor to ensure that our, that our developmental testing has an operational flavor or flair so that we're always, we're always focused in that multi-mission aspect. We, as we continue to the, uh, the, the continued development of those baselines, from 361 to 40 to, to now in the Navy's open architected baseline, we continue to improve that multi-mission capability between BMD and, uh, and those other missions so that uh, we can continue to make it as seamlessly as possible. I can't possibly improve on those answers. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, my name is Jeffrey David Capella. Uh, my question goes out to Commander McGrath, and as a member of the Direct Energy Professional Society, I'd like to give a nod to him regarding research and development surrounding direct energy and addiction methodologies. <clears throat> that said, my question re to the panel uh, kind of stems around the conflict between traditional high-intensity interstate and contemporary low-intensity extrastate conflicts, with such conflicts being borne out both doctrinally as well as from the perspective of allocation of resources made ever more acute to budgetary constraints imposed on military research and development and procurement via operational costs of current United States interventionism as well as rise of non-military public consumption. I would contend, as the Admiral had stated, similar to what you had stated, sir, uh, that, that such a you know, such a framework frames the issue in a in an inaccurate manner. Instead of it being either or, it has to be all of the above. And that balance isn't defined as some arbitrary middle. It has to be defined as what is Pareto optimal and maximizing crossover between those mission roles. So my question is, in light of the kind of things that direct and energy community finds, it's hard to find funding to secure enough research at effort intensity to realize any kind of research goals because of you know, what's going on now. How do, we, how do we get people to buy in on that? How do you get people to buy in on, a, on an overall homogenized vision because the direct and energy community, they've been gutted. Ryan? Make tough choices. That's what it boils down to. I mean, uh, people get paid to make hard decisions. And uh, you've got a certain amount of dollar and a certain amount of requirement. Um, I think uh, the, the, the quest for balance, the quest to uh, serve um, less important missions. Let's face it, I mean, if the, if the, if the budget of the Navy is dramatically cut, um, we could take off the two, uh, uh, two of the core capabilities, the maritime security and HADR, and maybe save a billion dollars a year. It's not, we don't spend that much on that. Uh, but we then have to prioritize in the other mission areas uh, and start making hard decisions. Um, I, I think there is no other way and I can't, I can't give you a better answer than that. There was a, a huge tension when we were uh, developing the new strategy. Uh, there was a, a view, and it was actually an excellent discussion within Navy that got people really mad, and, and there was name calling. So it meant it was really worthwhile. <laughs> and, the, and the tension kind of went like this. If you were, uh, if you were, if you even put HADR 
in the document, are you going soft? Are you a soft power guy? Because, you know, if you're a hard power guy and you want to just break things and kill people, then, um, you know, that the introduction of the soft power aspects into the strategy was in itself threatening. And I also want to thank you for mentioning the words Pareto optimal right. to an ops analysis and economics guy. That was very good to hear. I haven't heard Pareto optimal. Two horses shot from my master's naked up. But I will tell you, <laughs> I will tell you that uh, that debate was a great debate. And we came to uh, kind of a, an agreement that uh, first, that we probably needed to operate across the full spectrum of conflict, but that we could not afford a separate ship set to go do like the Gulf of Guinea. So then we had to get real about, well, if you send a destroyer to the Gulf of Guinea, it might only be 0.85 effective at, uh, you know, helping Nigeria, but it's 1.0 effective at the high end of warfare. So our decision was that we had to get real about the fact that day to day, you would take this high end force structure, you would bend it to these other mission areas, but you would never wake up in the morning and forget what you were built for and built to do. And uh, that's where we got to. And I agree with Brian that we need to have more discussions like that and have more disagreements and celebrate those disagreements as opposed to this, uh, you know, these jello discussions about, you know, give something to everybody. Right, I'm just saying it's hard to get everybody to buy in on that. I mean, I've tried to foster that kind of discussion and it, yep. people's cackles get up real quick. Yep. Apple Horn, any comment? Uh, from, from the uh, Missile Defense Agency's perspective, your questions on direct energy, I think, are, are, are useful. There was a, uh, a panel a couple of years ago that, uh, that recommended that advanced research uh, has got to, has got to be, uh, maintain a place in the Missile Defense Agency. You can't just uh, uh, build off of what you have had success in. You don't want to put, there's a reason that hospitals don't put pediatrics with geriatrics. So there, you got you to gotta keep that uh, seed corn for the future. And in that regard, uh, directed energy main, is, a, is a core aspect of what we call our advanced technology uh, right. section. So we're, we're actually working on that. And uh, while I don't know that I'll see it in my tenure on board ships, I know it is a, it's very part of, uh, a very big part of what we're doing at the agency. Very good. Yes, sir. Good morning, Rick White uh, from Back Tech. I'd like to leverage on a couple of items that Admiral Horn and then uh, Commander McGrath mentioned. You know, the, the third piece of that learn a, build a little, test a little philosophy also had to do with learn a lot. And, and the visionaries of our past that got BMD to where it is today used that to make sound engineering uh, decisions, never mind the programmatics and or requirements, because they used that learn, you know, learn a lot uh, uh, discipline to drive them. Going over to Mc Commander McGrath with the AMDR, it seems like we have gone back. And my question to the panel is, how do we, how does the Navy or the department create and an attitude that allows the visionaries to come forward where they can address engineering requirements or operational requirements despite uh, budget generated and or, uh, if you will, uh, allow me the, the Pentagon gen generated requirement to drive the decision. Are you suggesting that those, those ideas, those requirements do not come forward? What I'm suggesting, sir, is that in the discipline, the stepping out onto the windy corner of engineering took Aegis from baseline one now to shooting on a satellite. Those requirements were in some cases engineering and not necessarily written in stone. Um, when when uh, Vice Admiral Remp began to drive the requirement for BMD from his position, uh, that was a challenge that all of us lived in the early 90s, back to what Admiral Horn mentioned. And my, my question really centers around where's the next visionary? You know, and how do we create the environment so that that visionary can come forward, uh, not forgetting where they came from? Emma Horn? <laughs> I think uh, Brian would like to take that <laughs> one on. <laughs> I, 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 um, I'm trying, where I'm struggling, Rick, is just trying to uh, uh, link, link the two. Certainly, uh, the capabilities demonstrated 
very, very capably by Lake Erie in 2008 in engaging that satellite shoot down, where uh, before the, uh, I, I know these guys because uh, you and I work with them every day, uh, before somebody stepped out and said, we can do this, uh, there was absolute confidence born from that discipline engineering rigor. Uh, there was none of, there was no, well, maybe possible. There was, uh, we, have, we have demonstrated an engagement at this closing velocity. This closing velocity is, uh, is markedly different. Can we do it? Yes. Why? And, and that, that, uh, that conversation went on. Uh, uh, I, I think the, uh, the visionary leap oftentimes is, uh, is based somewhat on that foundation, uh, but not totally. I, I don't know that you'll ever get an engineer to, uh, to sign up to some of the things that Admiral Rempt, uh, uh, who, uh, who drove us to this perspective, I don't know that you would have gotten uh, that engineering community signed up in the mid '90s to what he was to what he was advocating. Eventually, the science proved that you could do it. So uh, I, I, I I think uh, making those statements is always going to require those forward-looking heroes that uh, that are looking to combine that rigor with the capability they see needed in in today's uh, fleet operations and and as you said, stepping out on that windy corner. Uh, I don't know that uh, we necessarily need to create a certain environment for that, but, but, but certainly recognize them for what they are, and that's that, that, that forward-looking uh, forward heroes that we talked about. Admiral Daly, O'Brien, any comment? Well, I think uh, the only thing I'd say is I do think that sometimes we are organized in a way that disadvantages the good idea that should, you know, be heard. And uh, we have some pretty vibrant discussions, but uh, there is a sense, I have at least, it's a personal view that sometimes we suppress uh, ideas too soon and we don't create the environment either for the, initi the, initiate, the initiation of a concept very well, nor do we, after the requirement has been set, such as it is, I think we've overimposed uh, the separation between church and state, between requirements and uh, acquisition activity too much. You know, we keep invoking Goldwater Nichols. There's nothing that says that when a requirement set is thrown over the transom that a good technical uh, counter can't be made or that the, that the acquirer could come back and say, well, I've looked at your requirements, you know, your two or three or five KPPs and your 20 or 22, you know, KSAs, and now I've got some trades for you. And uh, let's sit down and have that discussion. I don't think we're organized well to do that. We, we could do much better. Um, I, I don't mean to be glib, but I think the first thing we need to do is stop waiting for visionaries. Uh, they come along once every 30 years, and, and, and they're rare, and they're incandescent when they're with us, but um, we need lunchbox guys at Dahlgren <laughs> to, be, be, to be visionaries. Uh, we need folks that come to work every day and who see something that they think is wrong uh, or that they think can be done better to speak up and have the courage of their convictions. No one's going to take them to a gulag and put a bullet in their head and charge their family for the bullet. That's not the way this works. Uh, courage. Just the courage of your convictions in the engineering force to say that this is wrong and we need to do it better. I know there's a question here, but I'm, we're going to take a vote on something Indeed. since uh, Admiral Horn mentioned uh, Rod, Admiral Rod Remp along the way uh, just a few minutes ago. Here's a, a proposition that I want you to, we're going to vote on. Uh, in, the, in the same sense that Admiral Rickover is the father of nuclear propulsion and Red Rayburn, Admiral Red Rayburn is the father of Polaris, and Admiral Wayne Meyer is the father of Aegis. I'm going to suggest that Vice Admiral Retired Rod Remp is the father of Navy BMD. All in favor, raise your right hand. All who don't believe that, raise your right hand. Would you repeat it? I'll be glad to repeat it. That uh, in the same sense, to abbreviate it, in the same sense that Admiral Rickover is the father of nuclear propulsion, that Rod Remp is the father of Navy BMD. All in favor, say aye. All opposed? 
That's a pretty weak eye. Okay, <laughs> sir, you've got the, you have the question. Thank you. Michael Gabola, I'm the Aegis Weapon System Branch Manager at uh, Norfolk Regional Maintenance Center. There's been a lot of discussion with respect to increased op tempo of, of these ships and uh, the fact that they will remain multi-mission. I'm pretty engaged with the commanding officers and the TICOM on a regular basis. We've added a new requirement, which means we've also added additional requirements during their inner deployment training cycle. There's a lot of frustration on the waterfront, and it probably doesn't really trickle up to FFC from these COs that they have absolutely no more white space. So we're constantly trying to shoehorn the BMDRA in, and a lot of times they can't support it, they can't really support it wholeheartedly be because they have their crew engaged in uh, you know, possibly uh, boarding exercises and things of that nature. So if they, as this is a, a strategic requirement now, multi-mission or no multi-mission, we have to find some valuable time to, to get ship's force to engage in this before they deploy. Sounds like an FFC question to me. Well, let me first say that it has trickled up. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we, we got that. And, uh, and, you know, and it's been something that's really uh, been an extremely huge focus area for us over the last couple of years is getting the uh, phases of the workup right. And uh, you'll be happy to know that we've, um, we've taken the steps and have made the decisions to extend the maintenance phase so that it didn't crowd the basic and intermediate, you know, the integrated training part of the workup. So uh, we are listening to those CEOs, and I will tell you that they're right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've, uh, we've put too much into that bag. So what we've done is we've stretched out the cycle to provide them more time and to deal with the things that keep coming up, that, you know, everything doesn't always go right. So we've also done that. But there's also, you know, it's not just time, it's the maintenance of the platform. And uh, we took some decisions um, seven, eight years ago to remove a lot of the maintenance support from our surface ships. Correct. And it was, not, um, it was not based on a lot of analysis that proved to be correct. And uh, so we have taken the steps, even with this downward uh, resource environment that we're now facing, to restore that. And then finally, there's the same uh, piece for the people. You know, I commissioned a Aegis DDG. I was fortunate enough to be a PCO of a DDG, the Russell, and we had 298 enlisted on board. And today, the basic allowance for those ships is uh, 245. And we've, yes, we have introduced some uh, personnel saving technology. Yes, we have relieved them of some requirements, but not the 245, we haven't. And so uh, I would tell you on those three fronts, time, maintenance resources, and people, we have gotten the word, we have listened, okay. and uh, we've taken the steps to restore people to the ships. Uh, much of what you're hearing in the open press about, you know, Second Fleet going away or some other, you know, staffs going away, uh, those resources were then folded back in to put them afloat. So uh, it's consumed, the, the heart of your question has consumed most of my life the last two years, and I'll say that um, it'll take us a couple years to get back where we should be, but um, it's got the leadership and the uh, resources behind it to make the fix. Thank you. Uh, among those on the stage, Brian McGrath is probably the most recent to have commanded a ship at sea. Uh, Brian, would you like to comment on this? Um, you know, the, the life of a ship's crew and a modern destroyer is, is a busy one, There's no question about it. It's a lot to do. Um, I commanded from 04 to 06, I think. Um, during that time, we got the, uh, um, the non-compliant boarding team um, requirement uh, set to me, and, and I pretty much had to create a, 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 
a platoon of close quarters battle marine infantrymen out of sonar techs, electronics techs, and, and fire controlmen. Um, for whatever reason, the most skilled uh, technicians on a ship seem to be the ones that always want to be, that are in the best physical shape and are most likely to join those, those teams. So, you know, putting that requirement in, it hurt. It hurt my ability to do maintenance. Um, but you do what you got to do. I, I applaud the things that CFFC has been doing. Um, they got the message, and, and I think they're putting the money where it needs to go. You know, Wilkerson. I want to pony on what Brian was asking. See, I wonder if ballistic missile defense isn't a Cold War anachronism in terms of balance. And the reason I ask is one of the things we worry about a lot today with a lot of terrorist activities is someone doing something terrible to our nation or our people, and we don't know where they came from. So we don't know who to get mad at, and we don't know what to break, which is what Admiral Daly was talking about, which is the prime directive for military forces of the United States. What do we do that nobody else does in our country? We break things. We go out and make things go away. So my question for you to think about, in, in the imbalance of this world, um, we will know if someone launches a ballistic missile where it came from. And therefore, we will know who it is we need to be mad at if it comes at us. So just how much would we or should we think about investing in such a defensive system when, in fact, there are a lot more egregious and unpredictable weapons of mass destruction or threats that might come along? And I know this is above all our pay grades, but since Brian brought up the imbalance drill, my question is, if you only have a limited number of resources, um, how much do you want to invest in defendings for things like that, and how much more might you want to invest in preparing to shoot things that break things and kill people? Have fun with that one, will you? No, that's a good one. Um, well, first, uh, I still go back to uh, what Brian mentioned, which is deterrence. I think that those non-state actors and those people who are not uh, geography-based that you alluded to, um, they can operate in an environment that they do because the other people who are uh, state-based are in the box. And so I'd say prime one is that we have to deter uh, our enemies and that the BMDS has a place, the BMD system has a definite place there. Second, I think there's been some game changers where things that we thought were only state-based activity are now uh, able to be uh, flung at us uh, from that non-state realm or that organizational realm. I think it was a real game changer when um, that the Hezbollah launched a ASCM, an anti-ship cruise missile, off the back of a truck in uh, Lebanon and uh, hit the Israeli Navy ship uh, Harat. They, that was a game changer. And uh, we said heretofore it was like ASCM, high-end, state-based. Now. It wasn't about Lebanon. It was about a group operating from a truck in Lebanon. I think we are this close to being there with some classes of these uh, short and medium range uh, ballistic missiles. So two part answer from my, it's a great question, uh, General Wilkerson, but I'd say deterrence, got to have it. Got to be credible. Got to be there. Can't mail it in. And second, these um, things that were traditionally state-based are, you know, inching into that other realm. Not, not and I think it also you were pointing earlier, Admiral, about the importance of the multi-mission capability, the flexibility that's built in the fleet today also comes to bear here. Uh, Brian, uh, Admiral Horn? Yeah, no, nothing to add. Nothing to add. The, I, the, the, um, the thing I find most interesting in that question is uh, the equation of being able to know where the missile came from uh, and the possibility that that then sort of relieves us from a certain amount of, of responsibility. Um, I, think, I think that misses the point. One of the very basic points of missile defense and effective missile defense is, is the concept of foreclosure, and that is um, Deterrent, conventional deterrence works in, 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 I think, most theorists' opinion two ways. Number one, by saying, if you do that, we will 
we will hurt you and we will make we will bring pain upon you. What what missile defense does is brings this new layer of conventional deterrence that says, we'll get to that on our timeline. But in the meantime, what you try is going to be unsuccessful. And the um, I think what that brings in, in, in terms of escalation control, the options it gives the National Command Authority about when to respond, if it has to respond, um, it, it, it's worth the money uh, in, in what it can buy the NC National Command Authority. Last question. Thank you. Uh, Ken Kennedy from Center for Naval Analyses. Um, I wonder if we could quantify the demand signal that we're talking about here. I know the regional or geographic combatant commanders have a very high appreciation of BND ships. And we have 21 today, as you stated, Admiral Daly. Um, what is the disparity between the demand and the supply, and how do you project that out into the uh, near term? Well, that's, uh, you know, you've described uh, what we do every day. And it's not just for um, BMDS, by the way. Uh, Monday morning at 6.30, it was uh, airborne electronic attack aircraft. Uh, yesterday, it was, uh, yesterday it was aircraft carriers. Uh, today, uh, maybe it'll be BMDS uh, ships. But uh, every day, uh, we face this challenge that you're talking about. And the, uh, you know, people say sometimes, you know, this whole global force management thing, it sounds so dry. It sounds, you know, like, what the heck is this? It is the, we don't have enough stuff, so we need a system to decide who gets the stuff system. That's global force management. And uh, for all the services, not just the Navy, obviously, although I think we brought this on with the global naval force presence policy, the GNFPP, but the, for all the services, this is an everyday thing. Um, so the allocation process, the disparity for BMD is huge right now. Um, but I mean, it's not different from submarines or uh, people who uh, want uh, tactical aircraft on the ramp in their theater. I, I could give you a hundred examples, but the dis and I can't give you because it's a classified number. What is the regret factor between what is demanded by the COBCOMs and what they're not getting every day? But I'll tell you that uh, we're not meeting all the demand. I will also take this opportunity to say that in an environment where we had 10 years of war with significant supplemental funding, that the, the, the so-called, I mean, I wish I had a nickel for every time I heard this, the COCOM demand signal. And uh, demand is great. Demand is your friend uh, if you're trying to, to bring on a capability. but. Uh, in the environment that we're facing as we forward fit and look ahead, uh, where we're going to be facing this period of constrained resources, I would tell you uh, that you need to talk to your suppliers as well. Uh, who here makes things? Who here is involved in a company where you actually produce product? Does anybody have? Okay. Who of that group uh, would you say that you talk to your suppliers? You say, Hey, what can you guys do? We can demand all day, but what can you bring and how confident can I be in your ability to bring it? And that's where I think that it's been kind of, uh, the services have been a little bit in the background in the last 10 years and this important point. Well, it's all about the COCOM and it's all about the COCOM demand signal. And certainly uh, we've had to, in the words of the SECDEF, win the war we're in. But as we look ahead, that service supply signal, the guy who's going to make sure that there's shadows on the ramp for the mid to late next decade is the service chief. Ships at the pier and a service that's not a broken service, that's properly manned, trained, and equipped. And my boss had a lot to say about that yesterday. So yes, there is this gap. Yes, we're meeting the highest priority uh, requirements. Yes, we're building out new capability. It will never be enough. Um, and uh, so that's where we are with GFM. I would uh, 
uh, say that we, we recognize that uh, clearly from a, a shipboard weapons perspective, there is, uh, there is not enough uh, capacity today. Uh, so while we're attempting to improve that capability, we're also working towards, uh, towards the capacity argument as well, not only in ships but missiles. Uh, in, uh, in looking at where we are today with 21 capable combatants as we transition to the next two generations of capability, we're looking, we, uh, we have organized ourselves so that as Navy modernizes those cruisers and destroyers, we will be uh, in that modernization plan. So a, uh, an updated, open architected, if you will, weapon system will contain a BMD module capability. So as those ships go, to, go in and get modernized of two to five a year, that capability will, will follow them as well. So we're expecting that by 2017, that capability will be in 41 ships of the fleet through a Navy open architected computing solution. Uh, lastly, uh, from, the, from the missile perspective, with the, uh, uh, the latest SM-3 Block 1B missile, we expect that ramp to, take, uh, to go sharply up with it, to getting to about 530 interceptors by, uh, by that time as well. You can see that the general is about to give, in fact, he's trying to give me the hook right now, but we're going to take two quick votes before we get the hook. Okay, let's vote on this. Number one, that the Navy BMD capability will be just as transformational for the Navy as nuclear propulsion was and is, the Polaris system was and is, and Aegis was and is. Those who believe that Navy BMD will be just that transformational, raise your right hand. Those who believe that it will not be, raise your hand. It's pretty clear we believe it will be. Okay, here's the, the next question that we'll vote on. After so many years, the Navy is now on board and understands the importance of ballistic missile defense. If you believe that, raise your right hand. Navy's on board. Those who do not believe Navy's on board, raise your right hand. Okay, I think we believe Navy's on board. Please join me in thanking this panel for a most informative and uh, enlightening session. <laughs>